God bless you. Thank you for being here today. We need to pray for Ken and Brenda. They've been struggling with this um, this chest thing. Jim, um, we went and saw Jim yesterday. Um, he's he's doing really well. You know, he answered the door. That's a good start, isn't it? You know, last time I was there, he was sitting in his chair, but he answered the door, and he's really excited about being back here. They, he wanted to be here this morning, but he's still still looking for some strength. And so, but he's doing really well, and Moya is uh, likewise doing really well. Um, so let's pray, shall we? Father, we just thank you and we just praise you for the goodness that you've shown to us. Lord, we just thank you, Father, for the wonder of who Jesus is to us, the wonder of our salvation, the wonder of the truth, just to know that we are, we are your sons and your daughters and your hand is upon us and, and there's glorious purpose to every moment of the day, Lord, to every moment that we're on this planet until we are taken to be with you. And I thank you, Father, that you have promised to provide for us. You've promised to keep us, to equip us for the days on this earth, Lord. And we just ask for Jim and Moya and Ken and Brenda, Lord, and anybody else in our fellowship, anybody else in our family who is struggling, Lord, that they would know your Father preserving power upon their life to be and to do all that you've called them to be and to do. So we ask for your healing hand that you would raise them up, Lord God. You would strengthen them for the day. You would strengthen them for the purpose that you've called them to. Just as you would strengthen us here today for the purpose that you have called us to. Thank you, Lord, that Jesus has risen. Thank you, Lord, that you've made a way for us. Thank you, Lord, that we can rejoice in the knowledge that you'll never leave us and you'll never forsake us. Thank you, Lord, that we can gather in this place as a family and encourage one another. And and, 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 and it, as we know that that day approaches, Lord, that you come for us. Thank you for the hope that's born in our hearts. Bless us now, we pray, Lord God, as we commit ourselves to your word, that we might become the blessing that you want us to be, uh, wherever you will take us in this world. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's... Um, Has anybody been on away for the past two weeks? Anybody had a break? Yes. Yeah. Feeling rejuvenated? Ready for work tomorrow? You that have had a holiday? Um, I'm tired. Pardon? No one's responding. I mean, really. <laughs> Well, we've, uh, in, in the holidays, this is my custom, I guess. I, I leave the, the book study we're in and we do a, uh, a couple of topicals and we've been um, taking a few verses from John chapter 17. So if you'll turn with me to John chapter 17, um, and when we're back together, we will finish off Corinthians. I've been saying it for a few weeks, I know, but we're very near the end of uh, Corinthians. Um, it's been a great study. I think I remember warning you when we started Corinthians that there will be lots of challenges in it. And there have been many challenges in it. It's a great book. And uh, I thank God for that Corinthian church. I know that we've constantly highlighted the problems that were going on within that church. But if we're really honest, you know, they're just problems that have, uh, have reality to our lives here. And always have done in the church. That's why the Lord moved upon the heart of Paul to write those words down. Because it's relevant to us as it was to them. And uh, we'll be back in the, uh, next time we're together. So Jesus um, in John chapter 17 began, um, well, he's, it's this high priestly prayer. And, and last week we pulled out a few verses where, uh, in that prayer where Jesus was pointing to the ultimate design and the ultimate purpose of, uh, of all things. And the ultimate design and the ultimate purpose of all things you remember and you know is that it is to glorify God. Everything, everything that we see in this creation, in, in humanity, everything is there in the recognition that there is a creator and that the creator has brought and purposed in and through all of creation, us included, uh, the purpose to glorify God. Think about it. Everything from the most microscopic organism 
you know, from the most, most minute uh, form of matter to the seemingly endless expanse of the eternal heavens that seem to be out there before our eyes. At least our eyes can see them that way. Everything about it should and is purposed to bring glory to God. It's all for his glory. We asked the question last week, what is the glory of God? And ultimately, you notice know, everything that he is. Everything that he is, everything that he does, everything that he has brought into existence. He put everything about God. Is, is an expression of his glory and his person. And when we recognize that, you know, when you lie down on, the, on, the, on, your, on the, your lawn at, 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 in, in the daytime and, you, and, you, and, you, and you're looking forward into the grass and you fold that grass back and you see that beneath you there is an entire ecosystem, there's an entire, you know, seemingly another universe that's going on that, that you know, we're completely oblivious to, right? All these things that are going on down there and you look at it and you're just amazed. How everything is connected and how everything is working together. And then you roll over and you look upwards. And from that microscopic existence to the expanse of the universe, it just blows our little minds, doesn't it? It blows our little minds. Everything. Everything has this wonderful purpose to glorify God. And when we see that, and when we recognise that, who, who remembers the first time? Who remembers the first time you folded back a few blades of grass you know those bugs have always been there, didn't you? But you fold back those few blades of grass. You remember the first time you went, man, that's incredible. You know, millions of species living below our feet. You know, and suddenly seen through the lens of a creator God, it becomes just amazing how everything works together. And of course... The glory of God is nowhere greater expressed or revealed than, of course, as I was saying a little while ago, in the death, resurrection, and the ascension to heaven of, of Jesus Christ. You know, God so loved the world. We know the verse so well, don't we? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe on him, will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, isn't he? And cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The greatest glory of God is the work that God has wrought through his son to bring salvation and to bring our eternal souls alive. And into fellowship with him. The universe and the heavens, everything about it, all those things that we marvel at, you know, with all their collective beauty, they have no meaning whatsoever without Christ's death and resurrection. No meaning whatsoever. Because if, if Christ has not made a way to heaven, this is what we have to understand. If Christ has not made a way to heaven, then this creation... And all that we marvel at within it will perish along with us. So the greatest manifestation of his glory is the fact that he's made a way. He's made a way for you and I. Christ has died. Christ has risen. We sung it this morning. Death has been defeated and Christ has ascended into heaven. He has made a way for you and I into the presence of his eternal righteous glory. And you probably noticed I've been struggling to try and capture that with words. You hear Steve pray about it all the time. We will one day be in his presence. Then we'll know, right? Then we'll know what this glory is really all about. Right now we just... Yeah. So Jesus prayed in this high priestly prayer that God would glorify him through his sacrifice that he would because uh, he, he was going home when he prayed this prayer remember where it was remember when it took place the night that Jesus would be betrayed and arrested he was on his way from the upper room where they had, where they had, uh, pra had partaken in the Last Supper. Jesus had shared many things with them. John brings a lot of detail into that story from John chapter 14 right through to where to, to the, the arrest. There's a lot of detail there. The other Gospels refer to it. But it's the night of nights, so to speak, 
And it's this night when Jesus has left the upper room with the disciples and they've made their way down out of the city of Jerusalem. They've head down towards the valley, the Kidron Valley. They're going to cross over the Kidron Valley. They're going to enter into the, gar the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus will pray with three, will pray by himself. You know, he will call the disciples to himself. Then he will call three of those disciples deeper into the garden with himself. But then ultimately it will just be he and the Father reconciling his purpose for being in this world, submitting himself to the will of the Father, knowing that he is going to be betrayed and arrested, but it's somewhere between leaving, leaving the city and that time of prayer, that, that time with the Father in the garden, that Jesus is praying this high priestly prayer. And he's prayed about the finished work, the fact that he's going home to the Father. And I just think it's a marvellous prayer. I think it's an insight into that, that, that precious communion that existed between Jesus and the Father. You know, is it any wonder that the disciples would say, Lord, teach us to pray when we, got the, when we were given the Lord's Prayer? It's because they had seen this. They had watched this for three years now. They, they, there's something about this communion that they longed for. Every time they saw Jesus with the Father, they knew something was going to happen, right? You know? And that's why uh, the remarkable thing is that this prayer is recorded for us. You know, John wrote these words down many, many years after. After the prayer had been prayed, but they were like, they were like, they were like they were just spoken when he was writing them down, you know. Must have overwhelmed them, don't you think? Don't you think it must have been a humbling experience? Don't you think it must have been an incredibly comforting experience for those disciples to stand there and hear Christ's heart towards his Father, to hear it being poured out? The depth of that relationship? I'm rambling, sorry. It's just one of those things that you want to experience. That unity of, that oneness. So he's prayed, Father, you've given these men to me. He's prayed, Father, you've given them to me. You've kept them. I have kept them. Um, they've received and they've believed who I am and what I've come to do. And I haven't lost any of them. Any of them. He said, except the son of perdition, referring to, to Judas, who was not one of the given. Never saved. Never a part of the family of God. <coughs> That's kind of where we brought you to last week. And, and now he continues on. And so I just want to pick it up from verse 14 this morning. And he says, I have given them your word. And the, word, the world has hated them because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. Jesus is talking about, when he says, when he's talking about the world there, he's not talking about the world of humanity. What he's talking about, he's not talking about the physical world. What he's talking about is a godless world system that you and I, believer, are not a part of. John refers to it over and over in his writings. You know, I think he, he refers to it more than anybody, any of the other disciples. You know, and he, and he refers to the malevolence, its hostility, its hatred towards things of God, over and over again. John, he says there in one John chapter two and verse fifteen, he says, "Do not love the world." And he uses the same reference here, this, the world, the system of this world. He says, do not love the world or the things of the world. You know these verses, don't you? He says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, and he goes to describe this system, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of the life, 
is not of the Father, but it's of the world. Again, it is a satanically influenced world system that has sets itself against God and His ways. And it's all around us, Christian. It really is. Paul speaks about it in, in, in Ephesians when he says that you were once slaves to it. And we were. Let me read it to you. This is what he says in Ephesians chapter 2. He says in verse 1, And you, Christian, he, he made alive... We were, this is who we were. We were once dead in trespasses and sins. That's why Marty quite correctly said, we all deserve hell. But by the grace of God, we've been forgiven our sin. And heaven has been promised to us because of God's grace and His purpose of His glory. It says, you who, you who He made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world same word again the course of this world this world system notice what he says according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience among whom also we all once conducted ourselves and here is again in the lust of the flesh for fulfilling the desire of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath just as others. That's who we were. Look, I read, this, I read this last night. I read a blog last night. And I want to share it with you. And, and it simply went like this. It says, in our life, we were at the mercy of our sinful desires. Sin always takes God-given desires and perverts them. Eventually, enslaving us to the perversion. Sin takes our hunger for food and makes us gluttonous. It makes us greedy or, or it consumes us with self-righteousness, which would restrict us. Sin takes our desire for rest and makes us lazy or unwilling to work or sleepless or marginless, pridefully believing ourselves stronger than the weaklings who need rest. Sin takes our desire for sex and turns it, takes it out of marriage into the reckless passions or ashamed fear. Sin takes God-given natural desires and twists them until all that is left is a slave master driving humanity further into depravity. For we are all born under sin. Scripture makes it abundantly clear we were followers and could only exist as followers before Christ's glorious gospel came to us via the love of God. Can I read that again? He says, Scripture makes it abundantly clear we were followers and could only exist as followers before Christ's glorious gospel came to us via the love of Christ. We no longer are to be followers of the age, Satan and passion, Christ has set us free now to follow Him. That just resonated with me. It reminded me that I was once on a course as a slave. When He talked about the course of this world, it's a word that we would use for a weather vane. You know, and a weather vane just blows whichever way the wind blows, doesn't it? You know? Everybody out there thinks they're free, but they're not. They've just been blown this way and that way, this way and that way. Whichever way popularity goes, whichever way a passion-driven world goes, people are blown. And, 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 and I remember years ago, someone described it to me like a tumbleweed because they're dead apart from God. Remember what Paul said, you have been made alive who were once dead. Have you ever seen a tumbleweed? You know, it becomes just a, it once was alive, it once was connected to roots, but now it has died and it's broken from its life source and now it just tumbles whichever way the wind blows. Whichever way the wind blows, you know. And the funny thing about tumbleweeds is they all end up in the same corner. 
Because they all just get blown by the wind, you know. See it in society, do you? Whatever the trends are, whatever the fashions are, whatever's important out there, everybody just gets blown that way. You often hear me talking about things like, like, um, like, um, I can't remember what they're called now. Flares from the 70s. I think I mentioned it just a few weeks ago, you know. I see photos of myself wearing flares. Flares, flares like this, you know. Who thought that was a good idea? You know. You got some. I mean, that's just... But blowing this way and that way, just dead men blowing this way and that way. And, but you who were made alive, he talks about the course of the wind, and that wind is the prince of the power of the air. <laughs> Jesus refers to it, the God of this age. Paul refers to him as the God of this world. It's Satan. It's a satanically influenced society, world system, that is behind everything. You know? He says, we're not a part of that. Jesus here is praying to the Father. He said, we're not of the, this world. This world that hates us, just as it hated him. So let's read again in verse 15. I pray not that you should take them out of the world. I, I, I sometimes read that and go, Lord, why did you pray that? You know. But there's reason. But they should that you should keep them from the evil. That's much better, isn't it? You know? They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. I love that verse. <coughs> as thou hast sent me into the world, even so I also thou sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, Jesus says, so that they also might sanctify, they might be sanctified through the truth. You know what, Christian? I think that these words of Jesus are simply some of the most important things that he ever said. You know, I say that because there are always times when I find myself, when we find ourselves thinking, I just can't be bothered with this world any longer. You know, we've got an election coming up next year. And you sit and you listen to our political leaders. You're trying to win the acceptance of a godless society. And just throwing out anything and everything that will placate to a society that is driven by passion and desire. So, they get, so every election they're going to give, 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 give this. You know, and, 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 and anybody that has any leanings towards righteousness... You know, we call them the right wing, you know, to righteousness. You know, they become mocked and belittled as, as old or passe or just, or just historic. You know, we've got to be moving forward in, in, into a, you know what I'm saying. We hear it all the time, you know. And sometimes I just think in my, my mind, oh, who do I vote for? Why do I want to be a part of this at all? You know, you know. And I, I can imagine the disciples even, just going back to where they were, I can imagine the disciples just grimacing at the thought of facing a world after Jesus has left, after his death and resurrection. I mean, think about it. They were so few, and they were so weary, the enemy was so many. I mean, they could well have been times in their lives when they just would have thought, well, I'm just going, I'll just go back fishing, you know. Uh, and I'll leave all this conflict behind. And, uh, and, and look, I've got to be honest. I've been there a lot of times, you know. A lot of times I've been there. Where, you know where, I, where this happens to me? When I'm sitting on the toilet. I know you don't want to hear that. But I just sit there and I just think, and I'm working through problems and, and there's so many times over the years I thought, Lord, there's just so many people better equipped to do this than me. You know? There's so many people far more vehement about this than me. Lord, I, so, I just, many times sitting on the toilet I put my hands up and said, oh, I'll just go fishing. You know? 
I, I just go fish. Do you ever get like that for you? You know? No one. <laughs> Look, you love the Lord. And, and the cause is great and the days are urgent. We know all that. But sometimes you just want to close the curtain to pretend you're not home. You just do. Sometimes you just don't want to be a part of it anymore. It happens to the very best of us. David, you know, became overwhelmed at the sense of helplessness when, when he was being betrayed by his counsellor and, and, and Absalom, his son. You know, Psalm 55 and verse 6 reads, reads, uh, is, is writing about that period. And he said, oh, he said, oh, let me read it. He said, oh, that I had wings like a dove. For then would I fly away and be at rest. Lo, then would I wander afar off and remain in the wilderness. Think upon this, he says. I would hasten my escape from the windy storms and the tempest. That was King David, you know. It sometimes just gets like that. Lord, I know I have purpose. I know you've left me here for a reason. But this world just sucks. It truly sucks. And it does. I don't want to sugarcoat it. You know, morally, this world is a cesspool. Again, I looked at numbers last night. I sat down and I looked at, I looked at, the, looked at the abortion last year. 80,000 babies. 80,000 in Australia last year. 20% of all pregnancies were t- terminated. You know? I stop and I, and I think about that. You know, the fetus in Australia today has a one in five chance of being murdered. The safest place that God created for a, to, for a child to be, to be brought into this existence and nurtured and brought to a place, a one in five chance of being murdered. And, and, and I look at, you know, and I go beyond that, and I, and I looked at the marriage rate, I do this all the time, you know. I looked at the marriage rate and I was surprised to see, and I think I might have said this to you before, I was surprised to see that the divorce rate was down to 47%. It's gone down from 50%. Uh, But the only reason it's gone down is because people are no longer getting married. And the reality is it's still going up, you know. Of those that do make the commitment, you know, the average average, uh, lifespan of a marriage these days is about 12.1 years. You know, it's, it's, it's dead after seven years and, the, and those, those last 5.1 years are just, just a struggle. You know. That's what the statistics tell us. You know. um, same-sex couples, of course, uh, up by 34%. This was last year, it was 135,000 in our country. Um, 37% of all 14-year-olds, this horrifies me, 37% of all 14-year-olds in Australia are, are sexually active. Um, physical, sensual violence is on a steady increase in our society. The, the moral decay, it's palatable. You know. And we're confronted by it every single day, Christian. It washes over us every single day. And every single day, we have a world system that's trying to make it look good. Trying to make it desirable. Every single day, you and I as Christians, we try to represent God's righteous standard. Every single day, we are treated like, I know I've said it, but we're treated like medieval puritanical prudes that need to get with it. Aren't we? You know? And sometimes you go, oh, I'll, I'll, I will. Sometimes you go, I'll just, I'll just go fishing. But, so Jesus prays. This is why this is so important to us. So Jesus prays concerning his followers. We are not of this world. We're not of this world. And, and we know exactly what they means, what that means. And, and we also know 
there is a temptation within us just simply to disappear into the background. That's there, that's there. But it wasn't prayed. Jesus didn't pray these things and say these things so that I could justifiably turn my backs on the world. No. It says in verse 15, I pray not that thou, that thou, Lord, that Father, you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil. Keep them from the evil. First, we are reminded by Christ that our Christian attitude, this is our attitude, right? Our Christian attitude is not one of withdrawal. No. And I know I have had to ask God's forgiveness many times for allowing that attitude to creep in to my heart. But you know, historically, the church has succumbed to that temptation to withdraw. Even in the time of Jesus with the Pharisees, you know, they attempted to completely separate themselves from the fallen world. And they become, they become a holy, holy huddle. Them and them alone. And they wouldn't let the world come close. Certainly not in. And then we see in the, in the Middle Ages of, of church history, the rise of monasticism taking place. Where the church was doing exactly that. Monasteries. Were built and, and, and people would just pull away and separate themselves from. Have you heard of, 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 of Simeon Stylites? You heard of him? He's a saint uh, in, in, another, in, a, in a denominational church. Um, he's a prime example of this, of, of pulling away from the world. You know what he did? He spent 37 years sitting on top of a pole. And he graduated, is what he did. Now, apparently he, he, he got sick and tired of people coming to him because he, was a, he, was a, he represented the church. And people were coming to him with, his pro, with their problems and, uh, and he was well respected and so people were coming to him all the time and he just decided, I don't want to have to deal with all you people, all your problems. And so he found himself a nine foot high pillar and he sat on that nine foot high pillar and... Um, and he would only, you know, greet people when it suited him. But what he noticed was nine foot wasn't high enough. Tradition tells us he graduated higher and higher and higher until he got to 50 feet. And he sat on this pillar and he became a noted uh, uh, holy man. And they built a, in fact, they built, um, they built a barricade around him so that only uh, selected people could get to speak up to this fellow up there. You know, uh, young boys would come and they would climb, they would shimmy up this pillar and bring him food and, and shimmy down again, you know. And, uh, and he stayed there and after 37 years, you know, you know what they noted him for? They noted him for the amount of times that he would bow down every day. You know, and they would come, it was like, a, it was like a, a reverential thing. They would come and they would count. He would stand on his little platform and he would just bow his head down to his feet and he'd rise up again and he'd do this. He'd do it hundreds and hundreds of times a day. And, and he was this holy man, unapproachable, unreachable. In fact, lots of people started to follow him. People started to put up their own pillars, you know. But one day after 37 years, he was found like this. Dead. He died on his pillow. You know. What good is that? You know. What good is that? Separating ourselves from from the reason that we're here. You know. But you know, we laugh at that. We think that's crazy. You know. And and we certainly don't belong to any monasteries. We don't encourage that sort of church experience. But we, in a sense, can do the same thing by minimalizing our exposure to the unbelieving world. Because we don't have to deal with it anymore. And this is how we do it. This is how we do it. We go to church. We go to our Christian groups. We read our Christian books. We listen to our Christian radio station. We send our kids to our Christian schools. We even talk Christianese to one another, you know. And we have our Christian sense of humour, our own Christian jokes. It's amazing. You can buy Christian joke books. Just for Christians, you know. Now, now, look, 
N- none of these things are bad in and of themselves. But let's be honest this morning, in light of what Jesus prays for us. You know, we're, we're isolating ourselves within the Christian bubble, you know. Because that's what happens. The bubble becomes our hiding place, you know. And we become what John Stott, I love John Stott, they become what John Stott calls rabbit hole Christians. Have you ever seen a rabbit, you know, and it gets the courage to lift its head up out of its hole? You ever seen that? Some of you guys with guns know what I'm talking about. <laughs> what does he do? The rabbit, I oh, see, I'm only going from the Disney version, right? <laughs> So, so the rabbit sticks its head up out of the hole, this way, that way, all is clear, and it races across to the next place, you know. You know? And, and when we Christians, we do that. We, st- we, we stick our head out of our hole sometimes, and we run from the safety of our Christian home to our Christian workplace, where we seek out our Christian friends that work with us, and we gravitate towards them, and we spend our break time with our Christian friends, and when we finish work, we leave home, we go home, we get, um, at the end of the day, we come with our lovely Christian family, and we have our meals, and so on, and we go out at, Christian, at night time to go to our Christian Bible study, and we come home again, and we go to bed in our Christian bed with our Christian wives and Christian husbands, say goodnight to our Christian children, we get up in the morning, and we... And we're off again, you know. Um, do you ever find yourself? Let's be honest here. Do you ever find yourself making that brave dash, you know, from one Christian activity to the next? And that's what the world sees of us. They see us making this brave Christian dash, and they never find out what we're really all about. No, we're not of this world, but remember Jesus prays that we would not be taken out of the world. You know. Yet all too often, to use a Rob Plantism, all too often, functionally, that's a Rob Plantism, that's exactly what we do. You know. We take ourselves out of the very reason that we're here. We, we, we don't... This is what Jesus is praying. Jesus is saying, we don't need Christians safe in a bubble. We need them feeling safe in the midst of everyday life. And that's what Jesus prays. I pray not that they, look at that verse 15, that they should be taken out of the world, but they should be, that you, that, that they should, you Father, should keep them from the evil one. Jesus taught... That we should live our Christianity amongst people, not separate from them. Now I like this. As I shine God's light, as you shine God's light, as you are salt unto this world, he says here, he prays, Jesus is praying this for you and I, as you shine that light, as you are the salt to this world, Jesus has prayed to the Father that he would keep you from the evil one. Do you like that prayer? You know? You see, Satan, contrary to what Holly would have us to believe, is not trying Christian to drag you into hell. Because he can't. Remember what we saw last week? You're a gift of the Father to the Son. You belong to God and God has given you to his Son. You know? You belong to God and you are kept by God. And we have these wonderful promises throughout the script. I love Jude. Don't you love Jude? One chapter. With some most incredible promises there. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. With exceeding joy. God wants to do that. Present you faultless in the presence of his glory. So here's the thing. Satan can't affect your salvation. You need to know that, Christian. But what he will incessantly try to do is to use this world system to appeal to your human fallen nature that you might conform unto it, unto its ways. 
And so he wants to entice your heart of devotion away from the Lord that you will be ultimately, essentially, no different from anybody else out there. And how tragic it is when we as Christians are completely indistinguishable between the believing world, not the which between us and the non-believing world. Excuse me, sorry about that. And if he can do that, see, if you can spend all day with people and they don't know you're a believer, if you can live in a street all your life and your neighbours don't know you're a Christian, if he can do that because you look no different to them, then he has essentially snuffed out your purpose for being here. Essentially. The prayer of Jesus is that we neither conform to this world nor do we isolate ourselves from it. That's what his prayer is. Now look what he says. He, and and this, is, this is the answer, I believe, you know, to not wasting our time here. You know. He says, sanctify them. Verse 17. John 17, 17. Sanctify them. What does it mean? We know what it means, don't we? If you are sanctified, you are set apart. Jesus said, I have sanctified myself for them. Jesus set himself apart for you and I. That's what his whole life ministry was here for. Set apart to die upon a cross for you and I. And he says, sanctify them, make them holy. You know what it is to be made holy? Well, none of us are perfect, are we? Unless there's a rare individual in our midst. No. None of us are perfect. But to be holy, sanctified, set apart, it's a process. You know, positionally you are sanctified. The Bible says that. You are seated in heavenly places. Positionally, as far as God is concerned, you are set apart for heaven. And that's the wonderful security that we have. But, but practically, the Bible talks often about the fact that we are being sanctified and that there is a process taking place when we are being moved from a state of unholiness to holiness. When we're being transformed. Jesus is praying, Father, set my people on a path that leads towards holiness. Set my people on a path that leads them towards Christ-likeness. Each one of us is on that path. Each one of us. We refer to Corinthians all the time where it tells us that as we behold his glory, we are being transformed, right? From glory to glory, day by day. The goal is perfection. Never lose sight of that. That's what Steve's prayer is every, every Sunday, I've noticed. You know, we're going to be there one day. We're going to be in the presence of, one, of God one day. We're going to behold him face to face. We're going to know what it's really all about. We're going to know even as we are known, as 1 Corinthians 13 says, in that day, in that day, you know, the goal is perfection and you will be one day. We've, read, we've read, just read it heavenly, faultless before the presence of his glory. We will be perfect, but the plan is progress. The goal is perfection, but the plan is progress. Day by day being transformed, metamorphosized. It means being changed from the inside out. That's where God starts. Your heart. He starts on the inside out and begins to work out into the world around us. Day by day being transformed, being metamorphosized, not conformed. Transformation starts on the inside, works its way out of your life. Being conformed is, is being changed from the outside in. That's what the world is trying to do. It's trying to pressure you into a shape that you would be like everybody else. But Jesus is working on the outside. Who's going to win? Who's going to win, Christian? The eternal God has taken up residency within your heart. And he is transforming you. He is, he is sanctifying you. He has set you on a course towards perfection. Who's going to win? Christian? Come on, tell me. Somebody, please. Jesus, Jesus is. Of course he's going to win. Because he's promised to never leave you nor forsake you. He's promised to provide all your needs according to his riches and glory. 
His promise to continually wash you. Wash you, forgive you. He's promised to make a place for you. And He's gone to prepare that place. And He said He will come again and receive you unto that place. He even went as far as to say, I wouldn't have said it if it wasn't so. Transform. We're on a path. We're on a journey. We're on a course, and it's always looking towards Jesus. You hear Apostle Paul talking about it with the prize set before his eyes. Right? He doesn't look back because that's all refuse. That's all rubbish. Everything back is rubbish, but everything in front is glory. It's all God. It's all God before us. I love this plan, don't you? Progress, day by day, being transformed. How? How? Do we just get up and re- receive an installment every day? Is that what happens? Does God come to your program and just put in a little more information and push load and there you go, you're a little bit more like Christ? You go, that's ridiculous. Well, there is a sense that that's true, you know. It really is. Read it with me. Sanctify them. <coughs> Verse 17, set them apart. Put them on a course towards holiness. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, Jesus says, that they also might be sanctified. How? Through truth. D.L. Moody. Um, once I actually wrote in the front of his Bible, I'm sure you've heard this said before, this book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. What a great quote, don't you think? Jesus said in John 15, in verse 3, Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. So in a sense, he does give us Installments. He does feed us, doesn't he? He does bring truth. It's truth. It's not a computer program, of course. I can't, I can't put it any other. I can't put it any simpler than simply what it said. If you want to grow, if you don't want this experience on this earth wasted, you know, if you want to grow in your love for God, if you want to hate sin, if you want to serve God. If you don't want your life, I'll say it again, to be wasted, then you need to allow the Word of God. I know you hate me saying this over and over again. But Jesus prayed this for you, for me. We need to allow the Word of God. That's what sets us apart. The Word of God. We need to learn God's truth. We need to love God's truth. We need to yield to God's truth. You hear that? Learn, love, and yield to God's truth. Learn, love, and live God's truth. Because it's going to make you holy. It's going to do that work. You know what that means? That means you and I will be different from this world around us. Not weirdos. Not weirdos. For some reason Christians want to be weirdos. No, we're not called to be weirdos. We're called to be different. And it's a process of becoming like Jesus. You know, nobody hates Jesus, right? Nobody does. Well, the world hates him, he says. But I'm just talking about, I'm talking about the average person out there. You, you ask them, who's Jesus? Oh, Jesus was a good guy. Jesus said good things. He did good things. Church is bad. Church says bad things. Church says bad things. But Jesus is good. We should use that. You should realise that that's what God is doing. He's making you like Jesus. He's having you say the things that Jesus says. Live the way that Jesus says. How could anybody, how could anybody say to a husband who is sacrificially loving his wife, And has a blessed home. How could anybody say that's... Well, that's just not right. That's just not right. uh, You can't be doing that. They can't because it is right. 
Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Now, I know no husband has ever lived, loved uh, his wife as, as Christ has loved the church, loved us. But it's a course, isn't it? It's a plan. The goal is perfection. So if we want to not waste our time here, I'll say it again. Learn, love and live the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It will make you holy. It will make you different. It will make you something desirable to a world who can't work it out. They can't work it out. And, and you know, and they come to you, you know, someone's coming to you, you know, their, their marriage is a mess or whatever, and, you, and, you, and you've, got a, you know, you've got this wonderful home. And they say to you, well, man, what is it? You've got one answer, right? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. And they'll, I don't want to hear about that. And they'll go back into their life and it'll come and they'll continue to struggle and they'll keep seeing you shine. They'll keep seeing the shine coming from your life and from your wife and from your children and the security and the peace and they'll come back to you. You've got the same answer, people. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's always Jesus. I have to tell you, the Bible, God's truth about Jesus Christ is not an optional extra. It is essential for our survival. It is essential for our witness to this world. Why? Because the world system that we referred to earlier is going to use every means that it can to put godless values in your mind and your heart. It's going to be allurements for greed, sensual images, powerful attractions towards selfish lifestyles, selfish living. Those allurements are going to be put there all the time. It's a system that can become so intoxicating if we let it in. If we allow it to find root within our lives. If we let it, if we let it from the outside, transform us. But God's word tells us that the truth is at work within you. So it's not, an, it's not an option. It's not an extra. It's essential to us. You know, your Bible um, speaks beautiful things about Jesus. Wonderful things about this salvation. Glorious things, but at the same time it will confront you. It will confront you in the life that you live. It will even rebuke you, you know. But it won't leave you there. It will comfort you. It will console you. It will equip you. It will build you up. It's the plan. More holy. More pure. More spiritual. Sanctify them, Father, through thy truth. Let me finish with one verse. I thought, what verse could I go to that says it clearer than any other verse? I was sitting out in the car there before I came into the service. And it's Hebrews chapter 4. And it's verse 12 and it says, For the word of God is quick and powerful, and it is sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and of the joint and the marrow and a discerner of the very thoughts and the intent of the heart. The only thing that can set us apart and make us different on this path of transformation is the Word of God. You know, he says it is a sharp two-edged sword. The writer of Hebrews, when he says sword there, is referring back to this, the, the sacrificial system. The word sword there is a long, double-edged blade. And when the priest would bring the sacrifice into, into the tabernacle to be, to be sacrificed, this knife would be taken and it is so sharp. 
It's, it would just slice open deep into the sacrifice, exposing everything inside. You see, if you keep reading in Hebrews chapter 4, the next thing the Lord says, and everything is naked and open before Him whom we must give an account. What exposes it? What is able to discern between the soul and the spirit? See, we're always asking ourselves, well, okay, Chris, I hear this. I hear this all the time in the church. I know it. I know the Bible is the most important thing. Uh, but, and, and, and you say it, it's, able to, it's able to discern between the soul and the spirit. What he's saying is able to discern between that which is of me, soulish, and that which is of God, the spirit. So you're always asking, Lord, we're saying, listen to the voice of God, aren't we? You know? Well, how do we know the voice of God? It's spoken to us right here. You know? And I promise you, I promise you, give yourself to this. Allow the Word of God ruminate upon it as the Bible tells us. Don't turn to the left or the right. Hang on to let the truth be the truth. And you will hear the voice of God. People will say things and the word of God will divide. And you will, you will ask yourself, is that man or is that God? Is that me or is that God? And you will know. You will know. It saddens me that this book is being torn apart. And this book has been discarded for other helps. It's the worst thing that could happen to the church. It's the worst thing that could happen to you. Hear Jesus' prayer. Look, we're in this world for a purpose, for a reason, you know. God will keep you here until that moment, you know. I, 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 I love the fact that, um, you know, that God's in charge here of my life, you know. I, I love the talking to old saints, you know, you say, oh, I'm here, and I'm going home soon, and I know I won't go home until God calls me, you know, just to know that, and if God chooses to take me home today, it's today, and if he chooses to keep me here for another 30, 40 years, should the Lord tarry, I don't think he will, I think he's coming back much sooner than that. But whenever it is, it will be. It will be. You know? He's going to keep me here for his purpose. So I know occasionally you feel like bailing out. Look, I'm repeating myself. Don't bail out, guys. Jesus has prayed for you that the Father will keep you here for his purpose. He's going to keep you from the evil one. He's going to sanctify you. He's going to set you apart and make you holy by his truth. See, I could have just foregone everything else I've said and made said that one sentence. And it would have been enough, I know. God bless you. If you don't know Jesus today, all this is just highfalutin beyond your understanding. This is what the Gospel says. God so loved the world, I'll say it again, He sent His only begotten Son into the, into the world. If we would believe on him, we will not perish, but we will have everlasting life. Mankind is separate from God because of sin. God is a holy, righteous God. He sent his son, the holy, perfect son, to take the punishment for our sin. He took upon him all that is wrong on our behalf, that we might experience all that is right from his, perspective, his behalf. He became a curse for us, Galatians says, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We might become the righteousness. And to become righteous in God, seated in heavenly places, all of those things that you hear us, hear us Christians talk about, all you need to do is say, Lord God, forgive me of my sin. I believe that you are, I believe that you are the Son of God, Lord Jesus. I believe that you came into this world and you died upon a cross for me. I surrender to that truth. I surrender to you. Lord God, 
Fill me with yourself and lead me into the purpose of this life. If you pray that prayer with absolute sincerity, that's what you really want. To be a child of God. But guess what? You are a child of God. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you've called upon the name of the Lord today in the seat that you're sitting in, you said you want that. You want that forgiveness. You want that salvation. You're a child of God. He set you apart. He has a purpose for your life. If that's happened in your heart today, all of this will begin to make sense. You'll begin to see through the eyes of Christ and this word will become truth and a passion unto you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for <coughs> purpose. We thank you for not knowing all the ins and outs of purpose but knowing the author of our purpose we thank you for Jesus Lord God remind us when we leave this place Father as we look upon a world that is so contrary to holiness and righteousness a world that is constantly placating to to sinful desires, things that destroy relationships. Hatred, malice, unforgiveness, selfishness. Lord, we look upon it and we know it's not of you. Lord, I pray that you would give us a burden for this world. That we would not hide from it, that we would not run from it, but Lord, that we would be the light and the salt that you want us to be, to shine forth your great mercy, your wonderful grace, your perfect salvation, Lord. Spirit of God, fill us afresh each and every day. Give us great boldness to simply tell people that the difference is Jesus. The only difference is Jesus. Lead us, Lord, in the paths of righteousness. Give us opportunities, Lord God, to shine this light, I pray in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, that you keep us from the evil one. Thank you, Father, that you are the one who will exalt us. So, Lord, we're here in this place and we will humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God that you might exalt us in due time. Thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship him again. If you need prayer this morning, we'd love to pray with you. We'd love to encourage you. We've recognised here at Calvary that um, sometimes you ladies would like to have a woman to pray with you. So we have invited um, Trish and a couple of the leaders from the, the women's ministry to join us up the front here. And, um, and so if anyone would like someone to pray with them or simply just to encourage them, that's what we're here for. That's what the body of Christ is for. And beyond that, you know, the most precious thing that I see on a Sunday morning takes place out there in the, in the, in the cafe when we're sitting together and we're talking about the things that, that God has been saying and beyond that, that we're praying for one another. Um, let's be the body of Christ. God bless you. Amazing grace, so sweet the sound the saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see Hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave
body could as well home the sin and now is saved. For God who died came back to life and everything is changed. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power? The mighty King of kings has disarmed you. Delivered and redeemed, eternal life is ours. Oh, praise His name forever. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. And all throughout eternity, a song will be the same. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Oh, Christ is risen. Scars, your open arms, the beauty of your face. Through tears of joy, I lift my voice in everlasting praise. Hallelujah! Christ is risen from the grave. Oh, hallelujah! Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah! From the grave, and all throughout eternity, a song will be the same. Hallelujah! Christ is risen from the grave. Christ is risen from the grave, hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave, and all throughout eternity, a song will be the same, hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. 